Hey guys, this is the editor for Outsider here. Just giving a quick heads up that due to a technical mishap, Sam's audio for this on location episode didn't record properly. So he may be a little quiet at times. Ike's stories and insights still make for a great episode though, so please enjoy. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, uh, we're in Big Sky this weekend for the Total Archery Challenge. And I have legendary outdoorsman, Ike Eastman here with me. Well, thanks for having me on, Sam. Appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks, it's, it's uh, always fun to come up here. This is a beautiful place, beautiful mm-hmm. time of year. Mm-hmm. And uh, sit down and have a great conversation. The whole industry seems like they're here today. I like this one in particular because I feel like a lot of the business owners show up to this one. And I just, I haven't been to too many other ones, but I assume it's just based on views. Yeah. Yeah, and I've done Park City uh, a few times and Snowbird a couple times, and this is my favorite, partially because it's close. I mean, I only, I only live three hours from here, so. Did you grow up, whereabouts do you live? Um, Powell, Wyoming, which is northern Wyoming. We live about 100 miles south of Billings, Montana. Okay. Um, yep. How far are you from Custer, South Dakota? Uh, about six and a half hours. Okay. Yeah. I have some land up there I bought years ago. Um, I've actually only been there three times or so. There's elk on it, mule deer on it, oh, yeah. and I just uh, started using uh, land trust to lease out to, or to rent the private property out to hunters. So that's cool. Um, has I, that been working out? I've heard a lot about that. It, it is. Um, Nick, the owner of it, we were had our booth next to each other at NWTF in uh, in Nashville there, mm-hmm. and so it all just kind of happened by coincidence. And I put my property on there, and I got a. For my first uh, request, maybe I don't know, two days later. Oh wow! Yeah. So, so it's like Airbnb for for hunting property. Correct. So you have some land, um, you, you never don't use that often, or you're not a turkey hunter, or you're not a deer hunter. You go on uh, their website, and you can, uh, or you put your property, list your property on their website. Then um, end users go on there, and they look for private property they can hunt, and uh, you upload some game pictures, pictures of your land, and everything like that and people will pay you to go uh, use your land. And so then, uh, then I, 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 this is probably a shameless plug for him. I don't, I don't know if he's one of your sponsors. He okay. isn't mine, yeah. but but <laughs> I've always been one. I, I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> I've never talked to anybody that's been on the other side of it. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So so you, you it's all based on reviews. So if they trash it or whatever, you just yeah. get on there and, and there's probably insurance that's available if going yeah. through fences or break something or Absolutely. burn it down. Absolutely. God forbid. Huh. Yep. That's pretty cool. Land Trust covers all that. That's pretty Absolutely. cool. Plug for you, Nick. Yeah, check out Land Trust. They're awesome. <laughs> great guys, great ownership. <laughs> Love them. <laughs> They're not a sponsor a yet. Beer, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so did you, uh, is that where you grew up? Yeah, so I grew up, um, I was actually born in Jackson, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and fifth generation from there. My family's been ranching there for a long time. And uh, during the 80s, uh, we uh, went through the housing bubble and, and uh, actually my parents ended up going broke during mm-hmm. the 80s. And we moved to a little town called Thermopolis, Wyoming, which is uh, a little, it's, it's a little hot spot, but it is a recreational um, mecca. I mean, everything you wanted to do there. Uh, one of the blue ribbon trout uh, river that run, flows right through town, everything from antelope, lots of public land surrounding the place. I grew up uh, or moved there in eighth grade, started working on a ranch right immediately after I, we moved there and um, grew up hunting and fishing and, mm-hmm. and doing living the ranch lifestyle. And it's been it was good. It was I was on the drive up here. I was just telling the guy I rode up here with just funny stories from growing up on on ranches uh, in, you know, central Wyoming, the funny things you do as a 14 year old kid, you know, we were talking about getting stuck and he asked me, he goes, why do you drink out of a straw? I said, well, there's a story. I was 14 years old and I had a whole, I had a 10 head of horses in a horse and a, and a truck and we were moving them. They're brood mares. So they're, you know, they're wild pretty much. They're not broke. They're just for popping out colts. Mm-hmm. And I was pulling them up as two track road. We we lived like 85 miles on a two track road from pavement and raining and I got stuck. And so I was lifting the back of the truck out, unloaded all the horses and um, lifting the back of the truck up with a handyman Jack mm-hmm. and it slipped out and whacked me across Is the face. Like a high lift Jack. Yep. Yeah, it's exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We call them handyman's. You guys okay. call them high lifts. Gotcha. Same thing. It slipped out, whacked me across the face and 
bent my two front teeth back into my mouth. And of course I'm 83 miles, 14 year old kid. I just pushed them back with my tongue and went about my business. And ever since then, hot or cold, I cannot, if, if I, I will, I will piss my pants really? if I touch ice to my front teeth. Yeah. Have you lost any coloring in them? Are they going to fall out? No, huh? but oddly enough, one of my teeth is still a baby tooth and the other one never came in. And the doctor thinks it's because I damaged the pathway for it because really? it's this tooth. Yeah. Those Hylic jacks. I've seen guys using them uh, at Humvees and what you have to control it on its way up well, up yeah right? otherwise it'll sling slap up. yep and i've seen a guy turn and let go and that thing just went right by his head yeah and i'm like i think that would have knocked you out oh it, i'm pretty sure i was knocked out i don't know because i was by myself yeah i remember picking myself up out of the mud uh -huh. you know and i don't know how long it was but mm -hmm. it was it hurt so what do you do for a job on the ranch uh, i was just a ranch hand, just a kid and uh the rancher you know he had he had five uh, he was in his 70s he had five boys that were all in their 50s and stuff on not not much uh, to do with it and uh i was just the ranch hand and did everything i learned how to drive and ride and push cows and with, whip tails off of rattlesnakes that's not a lie with a bullet no there's this guy. His name's his, his <laughs> no. This is not a lie. This guy's name's Danny uh, Danny Peters, and he was a he was a sheriff for a long time. But he used to help us fence. Yeah. And he was a little crazy. Mm -hmm. He'd get a, a rattlesnake, and he'd get them to running from him, and they'd go down a hole. And as soon as their head get in the hole, he'd reach down, and grab their tail, and then he would whip the snake and it would pop the buttons the the rattle mm -hmm. off the snake and the snake would go flying and then he'd go find the snake and shoot it really yeah he just he had a he had a pickle jar like this full of rattles when i was a kid one of my friends uh i lived on base my dad was in the coast guard one of my uh friends his dad was from texas and he goes and we used to be into catching lizards and snakes and, he, and uh, he's like my dad told me something i want to try it and he caught this gopher snake um right where we were camping in the cul-de-sac in the neighborhood and there was this uh, gopher snake going through, and he grabbed it by the tail, and he whipped it like a towel, and it broke his neck. Yeah. And uh, I have never done it personally, but that, I've seen that done, and that worked. Yeah, it was, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. So, and he did it a lot. My buddy has a ranch in West Texas. He, he sold it a couple years ago, but um, he calls me. He's an older gentleman, one of my best friends, mentors in life. His name is Pryor Blackwell. And he calls me. He's like, Sam, come on to the ranch. Let's, ranch, let's do some hunting. Like, well, what are we going out for? You have pigs? And the way he said pigs, was, I'm like, I knew there's something else to it, right? But he's the type of person he likes to not divulge all the information and to L likes love, the love surprise. surprise yeah. Right? So we got there and uh, he's, he's like, I can't even explain what we're going to do. So you, you're just going to have to see it. We go to the hardware store, he gets a bug sprayer, uh, copper tubing, and uh, what are those like pipe fitting deals that you tighten with a screwdriver? And yeah. You put around like uh, your radiator hose. Oh, like pipe clamp. Pipe clamp, yep. And uh, then we go to the gas station. And he puts, We're playing charades now. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. Great job. <laughs> One point. <laughs> and uh, we go to the gas station and he puts, you know, fills that uh, bug spray about half full of gas. Then uh, we go down to his ranch and uh, uh, back to his ranch. He's like, okay, we're going to go down here and um, we're going to catch some rattlesnakes. I'm like, okay. And a snake grabbers, box, the whole nine yards. And he's like, watch out as you're walking down because they den up in these cracks and these rocks. So my buddy uh, found one, actually, Morgan Luttrell. It was with us, the uh, congressman from Texas. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we did a couple of platoons in the Navy together. So he was out there with us. We're walking down. He catches the first one. And then Pryor takes this bug sprayer, and he squirts it in all the little cracks, just a tad bit, right? And uh, I'm like, what the hell's going on? He's like, they don't like the fumes. Give it five minutes or so, and they all just start easing out of these cracks. Oh, my We're gosh. Throwing them into his bucket. or uh, like a wood It's bucket. like a horror flick. My brothers, my brothers are deathly afraid of snakes. He stayed in the pickup for a while. <laughs> <laughs> didn't I'm sleep like, for a week. Like, come on, dude, you gotta get the fuck out of the pickup. <laughs> he went down there and caught one. And what'd you do with them? We gave them to an older gentleman from town. Uh, he came in. We gave them to him. I believe he alive. Did, yes. Oh. And uh, he does just about everything with them. 
from the meat to hat bands to the whole nine yards. So, um, <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. No, I hope to never get invited on that. <laughs> I'm going to be really sick that day. <laughs> I am not a fan of snakes. So uh, when did your father start Eastman uh, Journals? So uh, the magazine, the flagship magazine, Eastman's Hunting Journal started in 1987, right after he went um, bankrupt in, in Jackson. Um, he was selling... Actually, let me back up. So in 1957, my grandfather, my dad's dad, had this idea that he could go to the North Country and film wildlife, film hunts. Okay. And so he mortgaged the house, bought this camera, and went up there and was filming caribou and polar bears and, you know, sheep and all this stuff. And then we bring it back down to the lower 48. He lived in Washington Mm -hmm. and uh, Omak, Washington. He'd bring it down to lower 48 and he'd travel around with it and, and fill high school stadiums. And then he would live narrate this footage. People had never seen a doll sheep. They'd never really? seen a, you know, a real caribou on, yeah. cause it wasn't, you know, TV didn't have that yeah. TV. It was barely color TV back then. And so he'd get these huge uh, crowds of people. Well then he kept doing this. And then in the sixties, he went to Northwest territory and made his first film, which was called challenging Northwest territories. It was uh, sponsored by the Canadian government because the Canadian government wanted to see if there was animals and if there was a market to hunt in the territories, Northwest Territories, Yukon, Northern BC. So he made this film and it's really legendary um, in the hunting world. You know, like your father's age, Mm -hmm. they would know this because it was everybody had watched this Mm -hmm. thing. So then he kept filming it. He worked for Disney for a, a while, uh, Walt Disney filming wildlife and sending, you know, wildlife clips for B-roll on their stu- mm-hmm. on the studio stuff. And then <clears throat> built a couple theatricals, lived in, in uh, Hollywood for a number of years. And then in the 80s, early, early 80s, or late, late 70s, um, my grandmother put him in rehab and he was an alcoholic. Got him out of out of Hollywood, bring him back to Wyoming, put him in rehab. And then in the early 80s, he was kind of just mulling around, lived in Bozeman for a number of years mm-hmm. and and uh, just kind of hobby. And when one of my uncles uh, came to him and said, Dad, we really need to put these old theatricals, we need to put them on VHS and we'll sell them to all these video stores around and then they can rent them out. Because there's a lot of people that remember those theatricals. Mm-hmm. And so they did that and they were selling them to, you know, every little town had a video store. It was even before Blockbuster. I mean, it was, you go into the gas station and yeah, one corner was a kid. video store, right? <laughs> so my dad went bankrupt and he started selling videos. He'd travel around all over the country selling videos uh, to these little stores. He's been in every single little town Everywhere but the southeast. But I mean, you name it. You ever been to Mechanics Big Prince? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. If you go across the tracks, he would say to the, if you go across the tracks, there's a video store in a in a conical. Really nice guy. <laughs> Stuff like that. Even to this day, he'll tell you things like that. So he was in he was in mechanic and this, this is where the story starts. He was in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, and the guy um, that owns the video store says, Hey, would you would you mind lecturing? to these guys want to come out west hunting, but they don't know how to do it. Lots of hunters in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Probably, it, I think it's the largest concentration of hunting in the country. And really? so, yeah, it, lots of hunters. And so he started lecturing and lectured the first time. And then he would go to Harrisburg, has that big show, right? Well, back then it wasn't owned by the NRA. It was just a Harrisburg show. He was sitting at a booth sell, trying to pitch or sell videos to people. And people kept coming up to him. Hey, I heard you're the you're the Western guy. I, I really, you know, my dream is to shoot an elk. I really want to shoot an elk. How do you do that? And basically, he he got tired of answering the same question over and over. So he built a pamphlet. It was basically a, a freak, yeah, a frequently asked question. And he just hand them out. Here's all this information you need to know. Well, then he's laying in bed, going, I should make that into a magazine. I, I can't, you know. I don't have barely a high school education, but I think these guys would be interested in it. And I'll get, I'll get them to come out West hunt and then tell me, and then send me the photos in their story. And I'll just print that as, you know, success stories. And so he started doing that. That's 1987. Well, it grew and, um, 
in 1987 grew till like the mid 90s and then he started the bow hunting magazine mm -hmm. in 99 and then started the hunting the eastman's hunting tv in 99 put it on the outdoor channel very similar to that the guy that owned the uh, that was uh, managing the outdoor channels my dad goes i'd like to put a tv show on on your channel so i could sell subscriptions mm -hmm. to the magazine um and the guy goes well i'll tell you what what's it about well it's all western big game he goes you think you can do 13 episodes of Western Big Game, only Western Big Game? Yeah, I think so. The guy goes, well, I'll tell you what, when you, get them, when you get them all filmed, you let me know. He goes, no, I got them all filmed. He goes, you have them all filmed? He goes, yeah, I've been doing this for since I was a kid. So he, he took these 13 episodes, put them on TV, and we've been on the Outdoor Channel ever since, mm -hmm. since, the, since 1999. Um, and then in 2008, he came to me and said, listen, I am... 61 years old i don't see myself doing this for another eight minutes mm -hmm. i'm done so either you buy it from me or i'm selling it to somebody else i was like well i guess i'm gonna buy myself a job because <laughs> i don't i don't know if i want to work for anyone else interesting time to take over the company 2008 you know people are getting their first laptops you know phones are internet on the phone just newly you know a new yep. thing and so you had a whole new problem set going forward. Well, and it was right in the time when people started going, oh, you know, traditional print is dead. TV's yeah. dead. We're going to, it's all going to be on YouTube or, or YouTube didn't really exist yet, but it's all going to be digital. It's all going to yeah. be digital. And uh, so I bought it from my parents, which allowed them, because uh, my dad always says this, he goes, this is a, this is a high profile, low pay job. Mm -hmm. We're not making billions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had to buy it from them in order to get them so they could retire. Yeah. And so I bought it from them and they moved up into the mountains. Um, he lived, you know, within a stone's throw of the wilderness uh, in Northern Wyoming for 18 years or 15 years, something like that. And um, I bought it from him and tried to figure it out. And that's when I said, okay, we gotta, we don't wanna abandon the traditional media, mm -hmm. but I have to start this whole this digital side of the world. And so I started a, an e-news, which was an email with, basically an email of what we were doing with the magazine was and that's he progressing into that at all okay he he knew his time one thing that my dad was really good at is innovation he was innovative from one of the first magazines to go from a computer to a magazine before that they had to do these color separations long story but he was one of the first magazines to do that he was one of he was the first tv show on the outdoor channel to film with a little tiny camera mm -hmm. versus these huge beta yeah. cameras first one to do that and he it was really really innovative but he's in his 60s he's looking and going i don't know if i can do this again i don't know if i can re-engineer mm -hmm. this company yeah. for the next step and so he said i think you can do it so here go do it mm -hmm. and so i started with the news and then um, we, we built a youtube channel which has 250,000 subscribers now and 150 million views on it thousands of videos um, we started uh, Eastman's Elevated as a podcast mm -hmm. in 2016, I think. And now we have six podcasts, my own Eastman's Journal podcast and Western Huntsman and a wingman brand. What's the Predator one you have? Uh, Eastman's Predator yeah, Pros. That's a great one. Yeah, Jeff Nimnick. Yeah. He's, he's a he's a killing machine. Yeah. No, he's a Marine uh, sniper uh, and he's just unbelievable super personality can't write with crayons but super super good guy on Does podcast he ever enter any of the like um i'm gonna call them coyote or predator challenges oh yeah he's won the world like three or four times so i had a gentleman over here last night we we're hanging out and uh grilling and drinking some beers and uh he is a big time caller mm -hmm. and he's like i just need another shooter and he's like look at the purses for some of these tournaments and one of them was like 96 grand. Another one, one Bobcat was, I think it was 30, point, 30 pounds and 15 ounces. Uh, that Bobcat alone paid like $46,000. Yeah. And he's like, well, if you know some landowners, we, I can call, I got another guy can call. And if you have, if you and one, if you have another shooter, I, I mean, we can, we can take a run at it. Oh yeah. And uh, you could do it January, February or March, I believe. Yep. And uh, so I think we might do that this next Oh, week. it's so much fun. Yeah. It's, you know, when you live out west, you have to choose what you do mm -hmm. in the winter. I love snowmobiling, so I don't coyote hunt as much yeah. as much as most guys. But yeah, he's he's done it a ton. Mm -hmm. He has he's had, he has his own TV show, uh, YouTube channel. Um, he's sponsored by Fox Pro, so, okay. which is a call yeah. company, yeah. or not Fox Pro. I'm sorry, Lucky Duck, which yeah. is a which is, they also 
don't let the name for uh, the CV. They also do predators. In fact, they do a lot of predator calls. Okay. Um, but yeah, Jeff is Jeff's good people, and and uh, he's he's won a bunch of those. He puts on his own classes. In fact, I'm working on a deal now. I started, so the next step of our company, I started a learning group. And okay. so taking some of the knowledge from people like Jeff and, you know, Brian Barney and all these guys and, and disseminating it down to where these guys, you know, if you, if, even if you're a seasoned predator hunter, you can always pick something yeah, up. Right. Absolutely. And so just taking all that knowledge and, and putting it in something that's digestible. What form are you doing that in? Um, it's online. Okay. So it's video, but it's all video form. Okay. So it's, I think. Our deer course, we have a deer elk uh, predator one now, and the deer course has like 108 chapters in it, and oh, it's wow. just chunked into, you know, less than 10 minute videos. So you can you can sort through and go, oh, I want to I want to learn more about glassing, or I had this happen to me last fall. I need to learn more about that, and you can figure out what it is and mm-hmm. gear and. Essentially, that's how I learned to hunt. Um, as a kid, one of my best friends, uh, his dad was really into waterfowl hunting. And um, I think we're in the fifth grade. We went and did the um, gun safety course, mm-hmm. hunt hunter safety course. And then we we're uh, then we we're able to go out and hunt with them. And uh, so started off um, duck hunting and some pheasant hunting. This is in Northern California. And um, then... Oh, you guys got great duck hunting. Yeah, it was just phenomenal. And um, then joined the military and ended up in Virginia Beach. I lived for the last 17 years. I just moved to Nashville uh, about a year, not okay. quite a year ago. Um and I really wanted to start deer hunting, and but I didn't know anyone else who deer hunted. And so I was asking around my platoon, and one of my guys in my platoon, he knew a, another um, seal, and his dad had a lease in, in Emporia, which is like an hour away. Um, so really long story short, um, joined that hunting lease, and he's telling me some stuff, and he, showed, he shows me a lot. He was a great, great mentor. His name's Ron Pogue, he's absolutely awesome. Um, but I had to default to the internet. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, Thank God for YouTube, right? Yeah. I learned how to, you know, of course, my buddy was there. Uh, Ron was there. So he helped me how to, you know, take down an animal and all that. But I got my base knowledge, you know, little, not even a working knowledge, base knowledge um, from the Internet. Um, and then I was, you know, bedding areas, where to set a stand. I, I was doing, doing it all, yeah. you know. And, um, and up there it's tough. Uh, white tail tough hunting is really tough because they run dogs mm-hmm. also. So you got to get out there during bow season and or black powder before rifle comes in then they can start running dogs. And so it was a, gr- it was a great place to learn because hunting was really, really hard. Right. And then I meet some uh, friends out in Texas and I go to Texas and that feeder goes off. And I, look up <laughs> and I see eight deer. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll go back in four weeks. I'm looking at it's more, eight deer, deer, more deer than I've seen all last year. <laughs> yeah. That's a fact. And uh, so then I started hunting in Texas a lot, but I got my, you know, my base, skill sets from videos like that. Yeah. So I think they're phenomenal. Well, and that's, uh, you know, that's our whole point is just to shorten that learning curve. Yeah. You know, l- shorten the learning curve and, and to give guys that, that are seasoned, maybe just a different perspective, yeah. you know, sure. uh, from killers. I mean, Brian Barney, Dan Picard, who's Dan's the group lead on that. Those guys are killers. They are absolute you know, in the woods, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And, and just learning simple tricks and tips that they have, you know, just makes everybody better. So, so I've never killed an elk. Um, we should fix that. Drew a tag this year. Oh, where? And the general tag for Montana. Okay. And, uh, so my business partner, Jay, he has a ranch, um, out here. So, um, I'm going to go take a stab at it. Yeah. It's Mid-September, you know, maybe the 15th, 19th, somewhere, kick it off. And, uh, but he has, his place has quite a bit of elk. So I'm Perfect. very excited. I went last year without a tag. I just had a bear tag, um, but I just wanted to go see the process. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh, the best way, you know, I've found to explain it, it's like turkey hunting on steroids. Oh yeah. Oh hell yeah. And I, so there's I a big, wait. there's a big joke out West. The guys go, is turkey hunting the same as elk hunting? Guys that elk hunt a lot just laugh. They think that's <laughs> yeah. hilarious, but it is. It's like it's like turkey hunting on steroids, it, except for when that thing dies, then the work begins. People don't realize eight hundred pound animal. That is a lot. That's a lot to deal with. You're talking five to six trips in and out. If it wasn't for Josh Fields, oh yeah. I mean, he he was out there with us and he helped us break down. And I say helped us. I just kind of watched and put a hand in where I could, you know, then carried some chip. Out, but luckily he shot it. Big dumb animal. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Uh, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, but Jay shot it 72 yards with a bow. So quite a wow, poke. Wow, that is a and, poke. Uh, they're like, hey, you missed it. You missed it. And he filmed it, and they you lose the arrow in the body of the elk, if that makes sense. Yep, it comes yep. up and it comes back down. And it's like, I think they thought he was high. And then, then uh, uh, he's like, no, I want to go check it out. Go up there, and there's good blood. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, let's just back out a bit. Yep, and give us some time. Better give him 20. You <laughs> 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 go 20. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just an endless quote of other people's material. <laughs> so uh, we go back in and search and form. It doesn't take long. I think we find him within 15 minutes or so. Uh, but luckily he went down this draw and up the, the other side of the draw it flattened out and we were able to get a side by side. Oh, okay. Within like 100 yards, 150 yards. But carrying just, you know, a hind quarter, 150 yards. I don't know how much those things weigh, but 100 my, pounds. Guess, yeah, eight, my guess was like 80 or 100 pounds. Yep. You know? And uh, it, I couldn't imagine humping that thing out. Yeah, trip five miles. Trip. Yeah. The guy you just met, him and one of the other guys that works for me, big dumb animals, they, ki- they killed this bull, I don't know, probably 2012. No, it had to have been. 2016 they killed this bull nine miles in and the plan was for me to go in and pick it up on horseback but i was on an antelope hunt with a a guy from mossy oak and so i couldn't be there till two days after that so they got the bright idea they were going to bone this elk out and pack it in one trip boned him out how many people just him just two of them they boned a whole elk out and packed it out in one trip dumbest thing i've ever seen and in grizzly country, number one. It's why they did it in one trip. It's, it, I figure, and I don't know this for a fact, but I met them at the trailhead the next day. And with the, the, I think those packs were 165 pounds. I was about to guess 150-ish. Yep. And it was dumb. Nine miles. Almost killed both of them. In fact, one of them tripped in the creek and fell on his back, thank God, and and popped his shoulder out, and they had to pop it back in in the field, and then keep trucking. It's just dumb. Don't do that ever. Just take stand, two trips. Standing up with a ruck that heavy is hard, and you could feel the pressure on your knees, your hips, yep. everything. I can imagine yeah. like nine miles. Yeah, it's stupid. My guess is it wasn't flat train. No, it's, it's thank God right most there. of it was downhill, but still, yeah. but still, yeah. And so, so don't do that. But yeah, elk, once you get one of those things on the ground, the work begins, and it, it's it is a lot different than a two hundred pound deer, or I mean, you're talking three times more work just to break one down. I know, uh, unreal. Um, when you well, I hope you, I hope you're successful, and you're gonna too. film it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going awesome. to film it. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I'm going to say it anyway. Josh Fields is going to come out and call for me. He is now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I got it. laughs> and uh, um, there's a handful of other folks that drew, drew tags. Um, some guys aren't bow hunters, so they'll come later on in the season. Right. And uh, I'll come back for that also and try to get a mule deer on the ground. And I would like to... Uh, maybe wrap the year up with a mountain lion out there oh yeah because he has some big cats out there yeah so and uh do do the elk and deer population a favor and yeah. kill one of those big toms I, it's eating one of those a week man out there uh jay was just out there a couple of weeks ago and they saw a monster so uh big good tom so good like to get on that um so when you were young and you started hunting what were you introduced to first like squirrels rabbits so um when we were kids my, my brother and i we we did a podcast on my podcast it's called eastman's journal podcast and we were, we got to talking about it was really supposed to be about him and we got to talk about our childhood growing up it's a lot of things you don't recognize when you're growing up because you just think everybody does that yeah. right well, we, we growing up, I don't remember not having a pellet gun or a 22. Mm-hmm. I don't remember it. Yeah. Of course, I'm six years younger than him. Mm-hmm. So he always had it. Yep. And I was Same just boat. dragging along, boat. right? Yep. And so we used to shoot these, we call them um, chiselers, but it's a Richardson ground squirrel. Okay. And there's no lemon on them. They're a pest. Yeah. And we used to kill hundreds a year and just constant. And then... Um, back then you couldn't big game hunt until you were 14, but you could duck hunt at 12. Okay. And so we had a pond, um, about 
two miles from our house. Uh, we, we, were, we grew up in Jackson, so it was, you know, a mecca of, mm-hmm. of fun stuff. And so we had a pond and we learned how to decoy and shoot ducks and, and get chased by moose and all that stuff since I can remember, just mm-hmm. a little kid. But my first big game experience, my brother turned 14. And so I had to have been like eight. And my dad took us into one of his honey holes from, you know, when he was in his 20s and 30s. And we did a day hunt in there and, you know, he did the whole dad thing and, and, uh, he's like, okay, the last hundred yards, your brother and I are going to sneak up here. You sit right this by this rock and don't move. And it's, you know, it's fall. So it's October and it's snowing sideways. Mm-hmm. And I had, you know, I think I had tennis shoes on. I was freezing to death. <laughs> might be the coldest I've ever been in my life. Try not to move, try not to shiver. You're like, is this moving? I don't know. I don't know. You know, and my brother missed a deer, but it was it was such a bonding moment or time because then my dad showed us how to build a fire using pitch out of a tree yep. and how to build a fire in snow when it's wet and um, you know I remember it vivid. But my first animal I shot was a mule deer, and uh, it, it's still it's on my wall today, and it's just one of the coolest experiences. wasn't a huge event, uh, you know adventure, but it was just me and my buddy and we were in eighth grade and mm-hmm. you know hunted all season and found this buck he was a on they own a ranch found this buck just off the hay field shot him with my dad's seven millimeter that you know he'd shot his first year with it was just awesome awesome time do you get buck fever at all um so i don't i don't on mule deer but i have had it uh-huh. on a weird impala in africa really? i could not hit an impala it, with a shovel it, it, it was horrible. I never rifle experienced but rifle. Okay. I, I had never experienced buck fever until that moment. Really? Yeah. I lose my shit. <laughs> and uh, Jay makes fun of me. All, everyone makes fun of me all the time. But I also love it because I'll be sitting there and I, I will see a doe, an animal that I know I'm not going to shoot. Like a young doe walks out and my heart just starts. Doof, 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 doof. Start hyperventilating. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, shooting from like, I, shot my whole adult life uh, and been to a lot of shooting schools, but I have to get my shit together before I take my shot. Yeah. I'm watching it and watching the animal, watching the animal, go through my breathing sequence and I, like, it's hard for me, I have to lock on. So huh. it makes it even more of a challenge. I'm like, man, I wish I could just sit back and relax and not have this feeling, because then I can- But if you didn't, would you continue doing it? Is that what you're chasing? Um, great question. I love it. We have a love hate affair, me and this feeling, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't feel it. Because sometimes it's so intense, it's, it's, uh, I don't like it, you know. But then as soon as I, you know, make a good shot, then I let my, I'm still going, then I love it. Yeah. So it's a, it, it's a, I love it. Sometimes I hate it sometimes, but, uh, I yeah. think, you know, I, for a long time, because I never experienced it, for a long time, I was like, me? Maybe I just don't have the killer instinct. Maybe maybe this just isn't it. And I, I now I've had it a couple times. I've had it on an Impala. Why I had it on him. I think it's. I think part of it's pressure. Yeah. I think, and I think part of it is um, something that you've been uh, searching for for a long time. Uh, I had it when I shot my hippo. I I struggled to shoot my hippo mm-hmm. um, because of I was just so ramped up. Yeah. And and. It, yeah, you're right. It's it's one of those things that it, during the moment you're 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 telling yourself you gotta get your shit together, man. Oh, yeah. This oh, is yeah. this is horrible. Mm-hmm. You're gonna make and there's a camera for yeah. God's sakes. It's it's recorded forever. <laughs> but afterwards, you go that made it even that much better. Yep. That much better. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't know. Right, right, right wrong, or indifferent. Um, what'd you do with your hippo? So uh, I didn't mount it. I got. I have. A, a patch of the hide tanned, mm-hmm. which their hides like two inches thick. Yeah. I didn't know this at the time. My whole plan was to have a patch of the hide and tan it and, you know, show people how thick the hide is. Well, you can't tan it. It's too thin. So they have to, they have yeah. to trim it. So it's, you know, boot, mm-hmm. boot leather yep. thing. But then the skull is just sitting on top of that. It looks like a dinosaur. There's kids in my town. No can come to our office just to see the dinosaur <laughs> on my, on my, in my, uh, Office, it, it, they're so cool. My buddy shot one, and he made boots out of it. Oh yeah, because he, you know, he lives in Texas. This is the snake hunter I'm telling you about. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was messing with this rattlesnake, and bam, it came down, and you know, uh, hit him. Hit him. Yeah, good luck. And I'm like, are you worried, worried about that? He's like, these are hippo. 
say nothing's getting through that. Yeah, Croc and, can't even get yeah, through that. Yeah, right? And, uh, um, and he just made a bunch of pair of boots for his friends and all of that. Um, They're really, it's really neat leather. Really neat. Super I wish I would have kept a bigger swath to do the same thing. Okay. No. Uh, how many times have you been to Africa hunting? Uh, five, six. I'm going, I'm going, actually, I'm going again next month. Really? Yeah, I'm taking my, my 13 or my 14 year old daughter and my 11 year old daughter and my wife and I are going to uh, South Africa. Whereabouts? Um, it's right up against Kruger National Park. So it's not high fence because it's open, it's closed on three sides mm -hmm. for traffic just to keep. I mean, it's right next to a highway. Yeah. And then the backside is open to the to the park. And that would be the north uh, west, west side. Yeah. Yep. I yep. went to uh, up in the Limpopo district. Oh yeah. Right? So we're, we'll be like two hundred miles north of that yep. Limpopo. Gotcha. Yep. And uh, I was up there with my cousin, and uh, he ended up killing. I think it was the forty second biggest kudu oh wow ever killed. oh wow we hunted it for that's what that's what one of the things that's one of the reasons i want to go over there they're uh, so cool we hunted this thing for i want to say five days or so and then uh finally get on them, right we just drive around spots you know spot spot glass 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 and finally get on them and uh he's on them he's on the shooting sticks and i'm right behind him I take a breath and then he goes to pull the trigger Oh, but he left it on safe. Thank God. And I'm like, that's your one alibi. I'm like, put it on fire, take a deep breath and just ease that trigger back. Yeah. And he walked the same. I mean, it, it tightened up, didn't go 20. <laughs> <laughs> which is where because they're tough yeah they're they're yeah. they're elk times 10 tough i think a, i think we're uh, 365 wow that's a oh okay i thought you were 365 yards i'm no, like no, damn no. that's a long shot for yards yeah so you know and uh there's 375 h and h yeah. like kicking mule mm -hmm. that's yeah. what they use to test rifle scope uh <laughs> rings because it's, really? it's yeah it has the most uh, the most friction or kick of any gun you know when we uh, got there we used the outfitters guns and uh yeah which are all from the 60s yep and uh these ones weren't bad they were remington 700s i believe okay and uh <clears throat> and at least the action was a, i don't know what type of uh, uh rifle it was but I, I think it was remington 700 altogether and uh we got down we shoot my cousin makes me look like a midget He's oh, really? six, six, three, Holy three. Buckets. He's he just retired out of the NFL, was in the um, NFL for the last 12 years. Oh, wow. Left tackle type and uh, large human being. So they have us go like, hey, you need to shoot these guns a couple of times, make sure you guys can handle it or so. And uh, then we shot it and everything worked out. They're like, well, it's easy for you guys because you're both giants. Yeah. You know? and, uh, <laughs> Still kicks. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, That's actually, I killed my hippo with a 375 HH. Yeah. But um, we were out there in the first day. Uh, we both wanted to kill a cape buffalo. Right? Oh, this, yeah. This is, this is, we, we have to Black play. death. Yep. Yeah. So we're out there glassing, driving around glassing. See um, a real nice bull behind a uh, couple cows. And like and Riley, Riley, my cousin, he's like, Sam, you're going first. I'm like, okay, let's go. Put a stock on it and... Uh, He's moving from my right to my left, and they're just walking. And uh, the my PH goes, he's one in the back. I'm like, yeah, well, obviously he's a big bull. And I get on him, I'm breathing, I go through my breathing sequence. And at this time, like, I'm keeping it pretty calm because we've done this iteration now like five times, yeah. right? Yep. And uh, so it's not just like I hopped out of the truck and walked, and you know, there he is. So I'm on this, I'm on the sticks, I'm on the gun, and then he starts running a little bit. And Ooh. I'm on him, and my pH goes, no, no, no. And the only thing I can think was, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I let, one, I let one ride and rolled him. And he's like, I think you hit him in the neck. I'm like, I think so too. He's like, keep shooting him. Yeah, shoot him till they quit moving. I just kept shooting. <clears throat> and uh, then he's like, all right, let's go up to him. And he had this little Jack Russell. This oh, yeah. Jack Russell runs up there. And I was so curious about this Jack Russell and, and uh, exactly what he's going to do. And the pH like, you'll see. He's up there and he's biting this thing in the ass or the balls or whatever, and it stands up, boom, I hit him again. Then we walk up and uh, uh, walk up to him. As we're walking up, he's still uh, moving around. So I shoot him again. The pH is like, I think he's going to die dead of lead poisoning. 
and, it's got a box of shells in him. And of course, I, all I've done is just watch a shit ton of videos. Uh, and like, oh, the only buffalo that kills you is a dead buffalo, right? Yep. So pop up. So I'm like, I'm not having this, you know? And uh, so that, that went well. And then later on that day, Riley goes to shoot one, right? And huge, huge dagger boy, right? Shoots. Like, I was watching. I think it's a little far back. Ooh. And then it runs off and doesn't get another shot at it. And uh, so we're going into this, now we're in this high sawgrass, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's tall, it's like six foot grass. And the PH just turned around and goes, this is how people die hunting kick buffalo. And uh, Riley looks at me and I'm like, well, we're fucking going. Yeah. The PH is going in there, like, well, we're going. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Is he uh, wounded? Is the bull wounded? <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. And uh, Oh gosh. And he's like, we're gonna move from tree to tree, right? And the trees, I don't know what type they are, you might know, um, but they're not big. No. And he's like, if you hear them coming, just scale a tree. Yeah. And I look at Riley, I'm like, you scale that tree, that tree's just gonna come over top of you. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he's like, well, that's our choice, so <laughs> I'll take my odds. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, I'll stand here and shoot with you if we hear that thing coming. And we push all the way through there, then uh, couldn't find him, couldn't find him, then eventually get up in a helicopter find him were they using the dog then the jack russell i don't think we we're using the dog at that point why i don't know but we could have but i just don't remember to tell you the truth mm. if we we're using the dog at that point um, those things are when working jack russells are so cool the, so cool uh, on leopards thing unbelievable i've heard about that too yeah yeah and uh it, he ends up um shooting him and it was a hell of a trip I, i've been those, chomping up the bit to go back since. dude buffalo are so awesome my dad my dad got um went down that rabbit hole in 99 and spent uh like five summers in tanzania his one of his really good friends became a ph in tanzania and in, in a place where they were shooting 40 inch buffalo and nobody had ever seen a 40 inch buffalo i mean they were rare and they were shooting 10 or 15 of them a year just unbelievable he's and he's got my dad's got some great stories of, you know, wounding a bull yeah. and then the bull. The bull goes into this Kansaka, which is just, you know, it's just trees. You can't see 10 feet. Yeah. And he goes in there and he does a loop and he waits for him to walk by and he charges him. And it, it, the PH made an amazing shot. And uh, my dad shot, killed the bull like right at their feet. But black yeah. death type stuff. And <clears throat> so when I went over in 2003... I had all these horrid stories in my mind. And so I was, I was apprehensive to shoot anything. I was like, it's gotta be a perfect shot. It's gotta be a perfect yeah. shot. And uh, I had got a 40 inch Buffalo that was, I shot, I only had to shoot him twice. Uh -huh. You know, shot him once and he ran and then laid down. I shot him again, that was it. But it, it was so intense. It Buffalo is. hunting is so intense. I love it. I mean, it. They just look at you. When they look at you, they look at you like you owe them money. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, <laughs> crazy. Have you got a leopard? No, I'm not a cat guy. I, really? I'll do it for management. Like, I've never killed, uh, I'm just not into cats. Not into cats, and I'm not into bears for some weird reason. Interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I love bear hunting. Um, I have not shot any cats besides a bobcat. Yeah. But uh, I would love to go, I want to chip away at the big five. Mm -hmm. So I think leopard might be next. But again, the PH, you mentioned the Jack Russell and the, and the leopards. Yeah. He's told me horror stories about that. It's like, yeah, you wound a leopard, you go up on it, and what they do is they jump up on you and bite you by with their hind legs. They scratch, and then they'll jump from you straight to the next guy and do the same thing. Yeah. I, and, they're, and their claws, so leopards eat rotten meat. Our cats, yeah. cougars can't. They can't really? digest rotten meat. That's why that. they have to kill fresh stuff every week. Mm -hmm. Leopards will eat rotten meat, and so their claws get all that nasty yeah. bacteria and That's stuff. What he was saying. And when they scratch you, mm -hmm. most people die from a bacterial infection, not from the wounds. Really? Yeah. The the pH, my dad's buddy, had been hammered uh, two different times mm -hmm. by leopards, like to almost dying. Really? Yeah. Went from him, hit him uh, four times, and barely nicked or barely missed his femoral artery. Yeah hit the the uh hunter and then killed the p or the uh tracker by just trashing him yeah so i read this recently um because i just love reading about hunting and i'm always doing research especially, especially about things that i have not hunted mm -hmm. just trying to learn as much as i can and i was reading about lion hunting and um 
I read that if you shoot a lion, you wound it. The pH is never worried, and no one else is really out, else is worried because a lion always goes at the person that shot him. Have you yep. heard this before? Yes. It, and that's factual. Yeah, right. it it's eerie how often that happens. It's it it's, can't be just happenstance. Yeah. They know where it came from. That's insane. Yeah, they. My dad has some really awesome stories about lion hunting with uh, with industry friends. I won't name them because they got in trouble for it because their family is against lion hunting. But where they killed this this male lion and um, they were calling them in with uh, how with an electronic call. Really, like they they had figured. Pro type? Well, no, they built their own. Oh, really? They would figured out how to call lions in, so they they call this male lion in and and basically. He figured out this PHQ was dead, so <laughs> good luck. He, he died from cancer, unfortunately. But he figured out the calls that are challenging calls. Okay. And so they'd pull up in a truck, hit the call, and the male, the biggest male lion, which would be the alpha male, would come out. Mm-hmm. And they shot this, this one male lion, and he turns and runs. And I have this all on footage. I've never done anything with it. He turns and runs. The PH hits him again, the hunter hits him again, the lion barrel rolls, and within seconds, there's four other male lions guarding this, this alpha male. And for so long, they were, they were false charging the truck. Really? For so long, they had to leave, and they came back like three hours later, and those male lions, they finally um, they came back with another hunter, shell, shot one of the other male lions in order to get them to leave him. But it's... it's, it's uh, unbelievably interesting footage yeah their yeah. lines are so crazy so crazy would uh would you ever line hunt yeah yeah oh yeah i'd do it just because it's it's that much it's red line in the fun meter right yeah. there oh yeah. you were red leopard hunting to me is like it's pretty intense but lion hunting that's that's the that's up here. I look at leopard hunting as more of like a time. Cons- like you put yes. in your time, you're going to get Sin in a dark blind. Yep. yep. 100%. You pay your dues. Mm-hmm. You know, it might be a week, might be three weeks, and uh, you'll get on a big cat. But uh, lion hunting is more um, active. Yeah. Right? It's more offense. Yeah. And uh, Leopard hunting is like, kind of like whitetail hunting. You just got to sit in the stand and sit there. Sit, your, there. sit there, sit there, sit there. Yep. Um, lion hunting is more like spot and stock, yeah. finding the right lion. Uh, I have a friend, and he went lion hunting, and they they were tracking the lion, and he's, if he felt like they were walking in a straight line the whole time, but they were actually walking in giant circles, because they were tracking the lion, and the lion was, was tracking them? Tracking them. Oh my gosh, and this is look, called a spiral of death right yeah. there. And uh, they look at you know their apps later, like we were just walking in circles all day. They, they were very successful, so they end up uh, closing the line out, uh, but that has to be an eerie feeling. Also, it was him and his wife. Uh, Oof. Yeah. Oof. yeah. Any uh, any bucket list hunts that you have? Now? Oh yeah, what, yeah. My yeah. my bucket list is a. I want to shoot a polar bear. I was looking. I, I don't know what footage this is, but I was looking at your Instagram yesterday, I believe, and there's polar bear footage on there. My grandfather back in the '60s. Was he filming or was he the shooter? Uh, so he was in that he, he, he was a shooter. Okay. Yeah. But he killed, I think 15, 10, 10, 15 polar bears in his life. I mean, wow. back then there was no license or anything. Yeah. And, they, and they, there's a really cool story. Uh, Black rifle did on my grandfather. Uh, it's called, it was called, um, stranded on the ice. They do the survival stories, you know, mm-hmm. And they did one on my grandfather, who's he's passed away and died in '96. But him and um, another guy got stranded on the ice, on a ice cake in the in April and survived for three days. Did the ice break away? No. So what happened is they went. This is where our story is going. They went polar bear hunting, and so they they'd fly out when it started getting where there was daylight hours. They'd fly from land out to the out to the Arctic Ocean and land on the ice. They'd find a bear yeah. and then land on the ice and him and then mm-hmm. kill him and then bring him bring it back you know the meat and everything and they were they killed this huge bear grab gordon claims it would have been a world rec- the world record by a lot a lot they were flying back got into a headwind ran out of fuel had to land the plane but the plane wasn't on ice then it was in the, what they call the open ocean so it was just slush yeah. and they 
spent three nights out there and finally got saved by the um, uh, Air Force. But anyway, go check it out. It's a really cool story. But he's killed a bunch of them. And so he was the, he was a, he was a hunter on that. And it, and the, the, the problem people don't understand that polar bears, they're like, Oh, they're endangered. They're not. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's what the, what America is trying to do with everything with grizzly bears, with lions, yep. with wolves. The, we are in our society is in love with predators for some reason, mm-hmm. not understanding that they need to be managed as well. Polar bears are being managed, but they're being managed by other countries, Canada, yep. Russia, mm-hmm. uh, Sweden, uh, Norway. They're being managed because there's a lot of bears. The reason that those bears get stuck, landlocked, is because they're young bears and they're getting pushed off the ice mm-hmm. by, the older, by the older males. What's it take to get a polar bear tag these days? Money. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. It's uh, upwards, almost 100000 I was going to get 60 to 100. Yep. And, and you go, and the, that's, if the, anyone that's ever gone, one of my good friends, Jim Wedge, owns Crane and Trek Boots, uh, tells, he has this epic story of his polar bear. And uh, he goes, the money's the easy part. It's the hunt. I go, really? I said, is it that extreme? He goes, he goes, it's pretty extreme. Steve Hornady, owner of Hornady Ammo, said it even better. He said, it's the only place on the planet that he's ever been, and he's been all over the world. He said, it's the only place on the planet that doesn't look like another place. He said, you can go to Mongolia, and you'd be hunting you know, sheep or hunting ibex and go, man, this looks like Nevada, yeah. or this looks like the Rocky Mountains, or you know, go to China and go, wow, this looks like you know, the jungle of Brazil or whatever. Polar bear is the only place that doesn't look like anywhere else. Where would you want to go? Oh, Canada. Canada. N- none of it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And you and you live with the Inuits for you know ten days, yeah. fifteen days, and you're living and eating what they're eating, and and I love doing that. Oh, it's it is it is uh, mentally absolutely grueling. They yeah. claim it's the hardest part. Is really? yeah, because you don't speak their language. Mm-hmm. They barely speak yours or won't, mm-hmm. and so you kind of it's kind of lonely and you're on snowmobiles um some sometimes they drag you on a on a sled yeah. that just piss pounds you into the mm-hmm. dirt it's yeah it's it's tough not to mention a 60 below zero and polar bears are very aggressive yes right yeah they're they're the largest man land animal and the toughest land animal and really? yeah they they run them with dogs is how they get and they'll run the you know the, they'll take dogs and then the dogs will get them wound up and the the bear because he doesn't have a flight mm-hmm. he really doesn't he'll fight but he's not fast enough to get the dogs and so the dogs will get him circled and stopped yeah. and then you so and they then you, him up essentially yeah pretty much have you done uh, hog hunting with dogs before oh yeah <laughs> that is a blast <laughs> so i did that one time this is a long time ago in south carolina my grandparents lived down there on Lake Anderson by mm-hmm. Clemson, and they knew I was really into hunting. We were going down there for uh, for Christmas, I believe it was. Christmas or Thanksgiving, but I think it was Christmas. And um, um, my grandpa's like, hey, I have a friend that uh, would like to take you hog hunting. And we go out there, and it's my wife and I, and I show up, and I have like an AR, I believe. And uh, he goes, oh, you're not, you're not gonna need that gun for long. And I had no clue what he meant about this. <laughs> and, uh, um, so I'm standing on this bush hog trail, and my wife and this guy push this thicket, and a bunch of hogs run across the road and uh, shoot a couple of them and go grab them, put them in the back of the truck, and my wife's truck. And then his, this uh, landowner, I think, I think it was his son and his son's friend, they show up with a bunch of beagles and some pit bulls. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Life's about I'm, to get I'm, real now. I'm like, what's going on now? He's like, now we go to real hunting. <laughs> He's like, you're going to use this big knife. I'm like, okay. And so they let the um, bay dogs go. And then, you know, maybe a half hour later, they're like, oh, they're on a nice boar. We drive to him and then he got this boar pinned to the ground, you know, by his ears and his jowls. And he's like, you need to go uh, stab that, stab that boar. Here's where you do it and how you do it. I'm like, your uh, dog, that pit bull won't grab onto me. He's like, no, he's too front sight focused on on this, on this boar. Like I just stab it and he goes, Stick that knife in there and just wind him up like a Model T. <laughs> <laughs> just keep circling until he quits. 
I'm like, well, fuck, how hard can it be? So, <laughs> that sounds easy. Never done it, but it sounds easy. So I went and all, all that went well. And um, they let the bay dogs go again. And then uh, Katie's in the passenger seat of her truck. And uh, she looks at me and she goes, I think one of those pigs in the back of the pickup that you shot earlier is alive. And uh, I'm like, nah, probably just nervous. She's like, well, it's walking around the bed of the pickup. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's some amazing nerves. <laughs> I'm like, shit, that's alive. Well, I got, now I got this this hog in the back of the pickup. And I just learned how to stab a hog. So I'm like, and I want to stab it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, because if I know in my life, I'm going to try to shoot this hog. It's going to miss. I'm going to hit a gas tank. I'm going to it up. Like, something bad is going to happen. I'm like, fucking shoot it before I let it go. Like, oh, whatever. So I have this thing pinned in the corner of the, of the pickup. And I think I end up stabbing him again. I can't really remember the rest of that, but I think I stabbed him in the, in the back of the pickup. Oh, geez. <laughs> You're lucky you didn't get you didn't get bit. <laughs> I, there was a lot of things going could have gone really wrong with the whole situation. And, uh, Just drive to town, <laughs> hope he fails out. <laughs> and then we get back. To, of course, this is Christmas Eve. That's what it was. There's Christmas Eve. Then we get back, and there's no like none of the butcher shops are open. No, no one's open. nothing's open. So I have my wife down there on my grandpa's dock, and I'm hanging these pigs up by 550 cord and gutting them and throwing their guts in the river. I'm like, Katie, I can really use a hand. She goes, okay. Buster oh, Archie came down there and helped. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> 15 years of blissfulness. <laughs> Here we are, uh, 16, 17 years later. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That's awesome. It all worked out. Hog hunt. Yeah, I have a I have a friend that lives in Mississippi that he he uh, trains those dogs. It, his stories, because you get a bad dog and they it don't last long. They just get those hogs will tear them up, tear them yeah. up. It's amazing what a hog can do. These dogs they had a Kevlar neck or Kevlar yep. uh, necklace on, yep. and then a Kevlar vest too, I believe. Yep. Because the owner had lost a dog to. Uh, to a boar before yep. and just gored them open and disemboweled them. I didn't know they, I didn't know they built that stuff for those yeah. dogs. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's way cool. Yeah. It's super cool. You didn't have a Kevlar vest when you're stabbing a pig in the back of the pickup. <laughs> I just had a good attitude and marginal looks. <laughs> a lot of well. <laughs> you know, <some> no quit. <laughs> That's but, uh, awesome. <laughs> So uh, are you going to shoot while we're here? Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has their world champion elk calling contest this weekend uh, here at the TAC event in Big Sky. And so they have uh, convinced me again. Uh, this isn't, it's, I guess. Might be a coaxed. Yeah, <laughs> coaxed, coaxed. <laughs> convinced me, coaxed me into uh, judging it. Okay. So I sit behind the curtain for eight hours and, and listen to Do you people. Do see who's calling? Uh-uh. Really? No, it's, it is completely anonymous. You literally have numbers like caller number 17 and they do, I think there's seven categories and each caller does, uh, like the world champion, uh, professional, they'll do five or six different calls like mm -hmm. cow call, bull call, you know, grunt. Um, and they, I think they draw them. I don't know. It's changed the, the way they do it's changed a little bit, but they draw like what, what number they are and they draw out what calls they have to do. So, okay. Yeah, it's, it's fun, but I am here to tell you after eight hours of people screaming elk calls into your, because you're sitting behind a curtain, so you don't know who it is, and they're off to your side, and they're bugling at you so that you get the full experience. For eight hours is a lot. It's a, but, lot, of the, a lot of the full experience. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. But it, it's fun, and, uh, you know, uh, Elk Foundation does really good work. They Their success uh, – conservation success is is unmatched mm -hmm. with what they've done the number of elk in, in the u.s is way more than than uh you know i think probably there's elk in places that maybe never had elk mm -hmm. and they've done a really good job uh managing that and and doing good stuff so it's it's my way to give one of the ways to give back absolutely it's great uh you, you mentioned that you know elk conservation and uh, I thought of something that I haven't thought of in a while. I remember it's maybe like four years ago now, maybe less. Um, they were there was a draw for elk tags in Virginia. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard of it. And I guess the herd's growing, yep. and uh, I, it was just a handful of tags. So, but the, I think it was 
maybe 10 bucks or 15 bucks to put in for it. Um, so me and all my friends, we put in for them, but uh, um, never drew. But uh, it's just great to see. Yeah, they have elk in Virginia and Kentucky, and they have elk in Tennessee. They have elk in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, and, and it and all came from, you know, Elk Foundation doing really good work. If you're not a member, become one. This is a shameless plug. They don't sponsor me, but I, I'm telling you, that organization has done more for not only just elk hunting, but public access. One of the things that they pride themselves on, and they do a really good job, is finding these landowners that are you know, key landholders that, you know, they have a ton of access to public land that they're the, they're the stepping stone to do it. And they'll work a conservation easement out so that people can go through it or they'll purchase the the property and turn it back over to the state to manage. Don't buy the easement. Yeah. They're doing that in, um, in Oregon right now. They bought a huge property that was owned by a lumber company and they've done it in a couple stages, um, and that gave huge access to the Eagle Cap wilderness that wasn't accessible before. And uh, so they, they've done a lot of really good work and, and do constantly do good work. That's great. You heard it from the man himself. If you're not a member, join. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they were started uh, two years. I think this is their 40th anniversary. Yeah. So they started two years, three years before us. One so. more quick thing I, I heard, and you'll know way more about this. Than so some of the elk callers are not hunters. Right. But I heard musicians do really well. Yes. Because they understand the music, the notes. They're just notes. Yeah. Right? It's no different than picking up a banjo and making it sound right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I heard that last night, and it it blew my mind. But it makes perfect sense. Yeah. If you can mimic... If you can mimic a song, you can mimic an elk. Yeah. If they're just musical notes, mm-hmm. that's all they are. Interesting. Just like everybody's voice is the same. Just musical I hate notes. My own voice on these and me too. I, <laughs> I begrudgingly do it. Yeah. <laughs> Not your voice, my voice. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah perfect. Well, I appreciate Hello, it. I appreciate your time, yeah, man. Thank you. Yes, thank sir. you. We'll, we'll have a couple cocktails tonight, I'm sure. Watch some yes, good video. Mm hmm. Appreciate you. Yeah, and, thank you. Uh, we tell everybody where you can check them out. Tell them about your journal, where you subscribe. Yeah, to. so eastwoods.com has uh, everything that we're doing. Also, you know, Instagram, Ike, my Ike, Ike, Ike Eastman, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we're doing a ton of stuff on YouTube. Check that out. The really, really good hunting content, gear reviews, and uh, of course, historic stuff. Yeah. Polar bear hunts, yeah. sheep hunts. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, brother. Yeah, yeah, take care. Sure.